Well, welcome to Access Chat. I'm really delighted to welcome Alan Moore today. I've known Alan for over a decade now. Alan is a thinker, author, designer, provocateur, uh, and has written some really seminal works that have shaped my thinking and that of many others on lots of topics from social collaboration and how communities dominate brands from 2005 to no straight lines which was a book that made me very cross thank you alan it made me think uh about how we ch need to change the way that we interact in the world and how we do business etc to the latest book which was written in 2016 which is uh do design why beauty is the key to everything and i, I think it's um really a, a privilege to have you here i'm very pleased that you could join us um because really big fan of your work really so thank you for for coming and joining us today thank you so much um i know it's taken a little time for us to arrange to us uh, this get together but uh, i kind of feel this is the right time to have mm -hmm. this conversation so uh, thank you very much and and so what got you started uh thinking about um about beauty uh, uh, what what took you on that journey right well i suppose in a way it does kind of relate to the writing in those straight lines um you know published in 2011 and i was very angry um and i've done so many things in my life um as a professional um albeit in a sort of red line around sort of around creativity but um i sort of ended up um feeling that i was really lost in a no man's land and i really did have a bit of a a personal crisis um it's fair to say i had a nervous breakdown um which was pretty catastrophic uh it wasn't the first it was probably the brought along by working too hard um driving myself too hard um not being prepared to forgive myself for a whole bunch of things um and really sort of feeling that I really was just totally and utterly lost uh, in this world. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? What does it mean to do what I should be doing? Um, what am I doing? Um, and yes, I mean, the, you know, the writing of No Straight Lines was very much about a sense of working deeply within, you know, the corporate world, uh, the business world, watching um the train come off the tracks uh i think um for a whole variety of different reasons so there's no reason to say that i was right um when i was feeling that but and say i was and uh you know and here we are so uh in this in this very dark place uh almost incapacitated in many respects I asked myself the question, I need to go home. Um, and by home, I mean my spiritual home, my heart home, uh, as a creative person. Uh, and I think all human beings are creative, actually. And we all have a home uh, in our hearts. Uh, it's, the, it's the engine room to the meaning of our lives, uh, why we get up in the morning and what we do. And I asked myself the question, what is the thing, the idea, the meme that will illuminate the path upon which I must walk and that will take me to the place of home? Um, and I've done this for different reasons. Um, and it is kind of interesting when you really ask yourself that question and you don't look for external stimulus because the, the the phrase is the way out is in so you go in um and you and you dwell within yourself which is actually a pretty vast landscape i have to say uh, and each and every human being has a different one um and that was the question what takes me home um what is going to give shape to the next 30 years of my life or whatever i have uh, on this planet and there were two memories that kind of came to me. And it, again, these are things that I hadn't remembered from 
being a very young boy and one was being maybe at the age of six, um, step often go uh, on holiday to Cornwall. Um, and I can just remember we're on the beach, the sand, the sea, the blue sky. Um, my mother was very relaxed, which was an unusual experience for me. Um, only because I think she worried so much about the well-being of the family. Um, you know, is there enough money coming in to do X, Y, and Z? Um, but I, for whatever reason, I was kind of really connected into that. And so her, her anxiety, I think I really, I really traveled with, with, with that. Um, and there she was on the beach, like this young kind of, freewheeling human being and it just gave me such incredible joy to watch her like that because it was so rare um my father was a beautiful man and he always was harmony i had a brother and a sister um I was very happy uh, being with them. I had my toys that I was playing with. And actually what what this this memory was saying to me is I was kind of going through it and deconstructing it, I suppose, from the first time since I had it, was this was an integral view of beauty. I was at one with myself. I was at one with the ones I loved the most, and I was one with the natural world. Um, and that, to me, was really important about this idea of beauty it's integral it's deep it's foundational um it's not ascetic uh it's something much more than that and the second memory was being a bit older i maybe was about 10 or 11 uh my parents came from london and uh we lived about 32 miles north of london um that's uh, what 50 kilometers maybe uh and every weekend or very regularly, we would go to London because the museums are free. All that stuff is free. My parents knew London like the back of their hand because they both grew up in it. And I can remember being in the National Gallery um, uh, looking at a religious painting. And it was very large. And I was impressed by its size. I was impressed by the exquisite and um, elegant guilt frame that this thing was in and i was completely captivated by the blue cloak on that someone was wearing and of course as a 10 year old boy you don't have the language to sort of come back to your family and say oh by the way that blue cloak on that man's cloak was absolutely fantastic and i love the brushwork and um but what I realized was as this memory came to me again from the deep freeze of my of my brain was that everything man made in this world is designed. Um, everything. Uh, beliefs, narratives, um, philosophies, uh, the chairs we're sitting on, the uh, screens that we're now currently using, uh, buildings, cities, you name And someone has to sit down and imagine that it would exist. How does it come to be? What are the materials we're going to use? Where are they going to come from? How are we going to order them? Um, what is the feeling that we want to create when we bring these things together? And in a way, these were the two memories uh, that kind of really said to me design and the other one said beauty. And then I sat down and wrote the book oh amazing um and and i know that you'd had a history before in design yourself aside from the sort of the marketing side of things you you know like me you're a f f you know, hope you don't mind you're fellow dyslexic um yes. yeah badge wearing yep. um yep. <laughs> so so you know and and i think you know that you've, you've got that different perspective so but but I think we both appreciate the sort of qualities in things. And I think that yeah. maybe sometimes when I find 
difficulties in things. When when something is well designed uh, and and beautifully designed, it's good to use. It's innately satisfying. And yeah. I think that the the dyslexia just makes you appreciate that even more. Or maybe that's just me. Or maybe it makes you more sensitive to it. Do you, is that ever something that you've considered? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, we, well, we're all, as, as dyslexics, we are all different, as you know. Um, yes. But Absolutely. I think that, but I think that definitely the, my way of learning was kinesthetic. Mm -hmm. you know, and, my, and my entry into the world of design was through book design. But it, it really was, you know, um, being able to see and then and then process the seeing um and and then through the seeing you 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 brought in the knowledge it's a much slower way of kind of working and i but i completely agree with you that something i thought a lot about which is actually if we taught um i mean maybe this is a bit unfair but you know if we taught like everyone was dyslexic maybe we'd have a very different way of kind of learning the process of learning maybe it would be more joyful um because i actually believe that the way that you learn is embodied um i mean back to your point about really good design about quality to me is also very important mm -hmm. that everything should be well designed um thought through uh so that the experience and that's it kind of connects really then also with my philosophy around craftsmanship is if everything man made in this world is designed um we have the opportunity every time to make it really useful meaningful valuable it should give joy to the world um and actually that's something that i was just reflecting on today um that we should find joy in the everyday and design has that ability to do those things um and i suppose i get angry get angry is when you see so many things whether that's in the physical world or what you know in the digital world and of course the two are symbiotic sometimes today where uh you can see that there is willful uh use of bad design to get people to make mistakes or for people to be confused and i think yes. that, that and that makes and that really makes me angry um and that's all about being money driven um uh to also kind of seeing that when things are really beautifully designed and you could talk about that in terms i'm not you know that's maybe something how it feels in your hands but it could be the enterprise model it could be uh you know so if we say a company like zero um which is a you know full-on digital company um it's accounting software as a platform but it's absolutely revolutionary in the way that it really enables people to deal with you know the ugliness of accountancy, because I can't think there's many people that get excited about accountancy, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, you know, and I look at, you know, the uh, a friend who have got a gardener that comes and, uh, you know, works for them, and he runs everything off of zero. And I think that that to me shows that really great design can be universal. It has a social purpose uh, for that. Um, it enables your life to be easier, uh, I think, in a way, um, and contribute something. And that, to me, is what that design element is really all about. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I know Antonio and Deborah have both got questions. A Antonio? So um, you, you were describing your uh, experience and, and finding that, that, that moment. So when you design, you, you design we design to ourselves and we design for others so mm -hmm. when you look at in terms of when you were describing uh, you no know, your experience of a, a beautiful and a perfect beautiful situation how do you then when you are in your design process how you make sure that the beauty that you see is also seen by others and not just become a kind of a selfish uh, thing that you created for self-satisfaction It, uh, I think that um, 
there are a number of elements to the answering of that. Uh, one is you must always practice uh, in terms of your technique, uh, whatever it is that is you are as a, as a maker, you must always be in practice um, because that's the way you get better at what you do. Um, I think that also you need to seek the truth in um, the thing that you're trying to realize. Now, uh, I know for a lot of people, you know, that sounds maybe off the cuff, um, a little bit strange. But I know as creative people, when you really arrive at um, something that really works, you have discovered the truth of the thing that you're trying to make. Um, and um, I don't mind the fact that a part of that is a little bit mysterious. Um, I mean, beauty in its own way always holds a little mystery for us. And in a way, it's partly why perhaps it has been moved off off the sort of, you know, this, the sort of center stage of business and, you know, lots of other things because of, of its mystery. But there is a deep connection between truth and beauty. Um, when we really know something as human beings, we don't think it, we feel it. Um, it centers something in a completely different place in our bodies. And, and I think that asking yourself the question about whether I've arrived at the truth of, of what it is I'm trying to make, you know, whether that's an app, uh, you know, whether that's a, a physical product, uh, you know, whether that's the purpose of the business that, or, or something you're trying to make. I think there's this truth and then it resonates. There's a resonancy there. And then you might want to sleep on it uh you know for a day or two days or for me sometimes a couple of years uh um where you're kind of saying what is this saying to me um and when it speaks back to you and says this is the truth uh you know that you can really commit to it um because it, it embodies all of what is uh it's it's asking for you to discover i suppose in a way and that is in part the sort of creative process. Um, and that in a way is where I think that, you know, a lot of organizations kind of get a bit um, confused sometimes around the ideas of in innovation or how you make, because sometimes you kind of need to sort of explore a lot of, a lot of ideas and possibilities um, to arrive at what is the truth. Um, but I actually really like that as a sort of brief that we will continue working on this project until we discover the truth and that we can all feel it. Um, uh, yeah, that kind of gets me quite excited, actually. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, um, Antonio. No, I think it's, it's important to to reflect to reflect on that because I, I think somehow everyone based on their own personal experience and they are now, and they are fine, will find you now something very personal to reach uh, that same truth. Yeah, yeah. But I think that, um, and there's obviously different ways of sort of, you know, designing, but this is, uh, this is a form of deep creativity, I think, and, and giving space to allow that to resonate um, is very, very important. And I think uh, in a way, sort of the way you've asked the question, it also is so, it re relates to time. Um, I've often thought about, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else. The world's speeding up. It's, da, 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 you know, um, and actually, do you know what? The universe just grinds out 86,400 seconds every day since we started counting. She doesn't change it. There's no, there's no, there's no acceleration of that. Um, I think there's a there's a perceptual sort of change in that, and I, but I I also know as a, as a maker and, a, and as a creator and a designer, and of course there are deadlines, there are times, 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 but we need to give time, the time things really need, be made well, that actually will live in this world, and if they're made really well in the first place they will be around for a very long time to come. You know, well-made lasts, well-designed lasts. Um, 
there's all sorts of other things to sort of you know evolve and change around that um and of course in part of our uh, economy that we have the consumer economy we like new 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 because that's what we're told uh is a good thing and i i kind of go back to the idea of well made um and well made is is well thought out um and delivers something substantial um to the world that we live in um and and should be in the service of many there was a great um podcast i was listening to the other day actually i'm a big lover of wine um and uh, a friend of mine sent me this podcast of a very famous uh, you know italian family uh, uh probably one of the mo most well known and one of the it's a family owned business and one of the uh, sons wanted to be a doctor so he could see the social purpose of being uh, of being a, a doctor but he was asked to come into the family uh, business but his question to his father was is what is the social purpose of making wine um and his father said to him well you know you can live a life without books or you know good food or you know whatever but to sit down to have a meal to read a book with a really good glass of wine makes the world a better place in my view and that is the social purpose of making wine and i think we can find good social purpose because i think back to for me back to the idea of beauty beauty takes us beyond the language of sustainability that life should be joyful it should be full of wonderment. Beauty has those sort of elements to it, um, which I think contribute to the experience of a human life well lived. Um, um, and, and I think that's sort of something that I reflect upon uh, a lot in many ways. Um, there's some very serious issues that we have to address. Uh, they are very pressing. But I think there are other uh, elements that we should not ignore in that sort of time frame and continuum of what it means to live on this planet when we're gifted this opportunity for the time that we have. Alan, I, I, I'm so impressed with your wisdom. I'm so impressed and I want to thank Neil for having you on um, Access Chat because I did not know about your work and I'm sad I didn't know about your work, but now that I do, um, <laughs> I'm going to really oh, bathe in you. it. So, but I love a few things about your story, and I actually um, having ADHD, my you know behind the scenes, not dyslexia, but I, I was out looking at your stuff, and I found the CEO guide to creating a beautiful business, mm -hmm. which he mm -hmm. offers for free. So I I'm in love with the, this document that you created. It's really amazing, but. Um, and I'm going to show it to my team because I'm just very impressed with the work. But I also, the, the story you were telling about being a little boy and um, your wonderful mother. And um, I, I also had some of the same experiences. My poor mother, um, she has passed over now, but my mother had borderline personality disorder. And um, I'm not exactly sure when life broke her, but my poor mother, she she just struggled the the world was a really dark mean ugly place that was coming for us and and it, mm. it how i responded to it was i tried to be the good girl if i was the good girl of a family of five um i you know sometimes i was in, in, invisible which maybe is why mm. i have purple hair now but but at the same time there was such beauty, using your word, of with my mother. There was so much beauty associated with who she was and this battle that she fought her whole life. And mm. it affected me so much. And then I wound up having um, two children and my daughter, my oldest daughter, I named after my mom because I really, really loved my mom a lot. And, and my daughter was born um, with Down syndrome. And when she was born with Down syndrome, the response from the family it, it was very interesting because they're like, oh, we've never had anybody with a disability. Oh, I guess we're not counting borderline disorder and <laughs> autism and ADHD and dyslexia, right? So it's like, but, but okay, we get down. So anyway, but the, the lessons that I've learned from these extremes in my life have been 
I'm going to go back to that word. I love that word beauty because right now, yes, the world's a mess. Maybe it's more of a mess than it's ever been. I don't know. It, it, I just think that the data gets to us faster. Uh, I mm. think there's so much that we need to learn with what's happening with who we are as humanity, what's happening with mm. technology, all these different things. And and the thought of considering beauty in your business and considering beauty in your design and uh -huh. considering beauty when you you evaluate who your employees are. We just, I look at, you know, Neil. Neil has dyslexia and I, I think Atos is so lucky to have Neil and Antonio. And sometimes I'm not sure if they even realize the value and the beauty that these two men, just as an example, bring to this gigantic ethos, you know. But they, they, then you start multiplying that out over and over and over throughout these businesses and the design. And it seemed like we did, we, we valued the, the, um, the pride in design more in the past. And I don't think that's in some ways true. I think there's still a lot of craftsmen. I was looking at some of the pictures you had in the CEO guide. There was this wonderful yeah. looking man that has tattoos and he <laughs> sort of looks like, like my son and he seems to be crafting this beautiful knife. Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. I am I'm more than willing to pay more money for something that's well designed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I'm fascinated with certainly how this works in design, but also how you tie it into business because we work, you know, our lives so that we can live our lives. So mm -hmm. how do you really get the executives to buy into caring about who we are in every aspect of the beauty word from design to making sure we all can be included so yeah. tying it into everything we're doing. But I think it's just, I, I, I want to thank you for your work because it, I, I think it is so important and right now, probably mm. more than ever before, for this kind of work to be go, go out and to be embedded into whatever these gigantic corporations are doing. And and we're, we're suspicious of these gigantic, and, and some of the other corporations, even a few we talked about before we got on air, that think it's only about money. I can break mm. all the rules I want along the way. I can step on whoever I want. I can steal your work. I can do whatever I want as long as I make the most money. And so yeah. I, I think work like yours, you know, I'm glad that we're turning up the volume mirror here, but I'm very impressed with all Thank the moving you. parts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, the idea in a sense is if, 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 Beauty is integral to the world, and actually, we are we are part of the, the natural world. Um, then we, we of business, um, and that can be you know be broken down into purpose, into culture, workplace. It, it, just to give some stats for business. So, if you put well-being. Um, as a central kind of aspect of your uh, the way that your company operates, you will increase productivity by 25%. And, you know, I've challenged, um, and I suppose in a way because of the work I've done in the past, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, take that conversation into boardrooms and have it with people. And I say, so if you think that, you know, moving people out of uh, full employment into third party agencies so you can, you know, um, show how you're more, you know, financially efficiently running the business. The reality is, is that what you're doing is, is you're breaking, you're literally breaking the world apart. You're breaking people. And the cost is being, um, is not sitting in that column, but it's actually sitting in a whole set of other columns as a consequence of that. So if you want the most talented people to work for you, you have to really put well-being at the at the core of what you do. Um, Purpose-driven companies outperform their competitors on the stock market by a factor of 12. Okay, um, you make amazingly designed products and services. So, i.e., you're not designing your products so they cheat, um, or they lie, or they break. Um, you are uh, actually, I think, 12 times more likely to get a sale, or six times more likely for people to recommend, and five times more likely for people to forgive a mistake. Then if you look at the idea of beauty as the 
the business model of nature and i would say that actually nature is probably one of the longest r d projects we have ever known no company could ever afford what nature has done in terms of working out how to grow nurture be resilient and regenerate so the word is very important is in fact if you designed your business uh, let's say you're your manufacturing business or whatever to be regenerative. So you think about the cost of where you take things from, the cost of actually what it is you make um, and the cost of what it is you waste. If you actually really look at all of that, you can start to significantly reduce the running costs of your business by thinking about those things. Um, there is a term which is kind of popular, which is the circular economy. But I kind of like the idea that, you know, the business model is, is the ultimate metrics, the only KPI you want. Um, and uh, actually, you only need to really think about, is my business being really working in that regenerative model? Because if I'm not, then actually it's costing a lot of money. And um, that still may be being taught in business schools. That still may, may be an ideology. But I think it's actually when you look at what is currently happening, there is a generation that is coming up, uh, which are in their 30s, uh, and maybe a little older, maybe a bit younger. And some of us are a lot older, but we are part of that, that movement. And we're saying there is another way of doing business is and and, you know, we can Absolutely. do great stuff. Um, but actually, we can do it in an ethical way in a responsible way um, and we can make it's a question of actually how you see the way that you make your profit and then where that profit goes a good gardener always knows that the compost heap in a sense is that a part of the profit making must always go back into the soil to regenerate that's the way that you continue okay. to evolve and grow yeah. great metaphor um, I I'm super interested in this because um, what you're talking about here are externalities. You know, we're business business is doing stuff and not looking at the, the the stuff outside of profit. We're not measuring any of these kind of things outside mm. and the cost to society, the cost to people's happiness, their well-being, uh, the environment, etc. So. Um, one of the things that, well, there are a couple of things. I mean, uh, we're, we're within our own organization, we're looking at beyond circular economy, and you were talking about regeneration. Um, we've nicknamed it restorativity, you know, because we want to, you know, uh, you know, help mimic nature and and and, um, and help restore and rebuild and regenerate. Um, but I'm also interested because essentially when we're excluding people from particip participation, um, mm. that's an externality as well when we're in the design and the construction and building process. So uh, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about is we should be treating um, inaccessibility like we treat pollution and finding ways of dealing with it in a holistic manner as well. So I, I think that, that, that all of these, there's a con confluence of all of these ways of thinking that that hopefully they're going to have a profound effect on how we do business and how we uh, live our lives in in the and i hope not too distant future uh because i want to be part of it um yes. that, that, that are going to make a difference and, and and the final thing is i've started buying lots of old stuff um mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm, I've always been fascinated with it. So you go around, you know, what are called junk shops, um, and you look at the quality of the craftsmanship of the stuff that's been made because it's been meant, it's been built to last for a, a long period of time. And 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 what we have now is we have this disposability of all all of the stuff that we consume. And yes, we all know, we recognize there is an underlying recognition that the planet can't sustain it. It's not just about energy use, it's about rare earths, it's about all of these other uh, parts of you know uh, that we use to make your iPhone, to make these other beautiful things. You know, beauty has a consequence sometimes. Um, but at the same time, we we can design business models, like the composting business model, we can mine waste uh it's you know the 
the slag heaps full of electronics should be the compost heaps of of our future business you know as we're gardening you know tending the garden of our business so i think what you're saying is is really fascinating i've i've loved engaging with you this afternoon we're reaching the end of our half an hour so i need to thank our supporters barclays access microlink and my clear text for keeping the lights on uh keeping us captioned and accessible and i'm really um thankful that you could join us today alan and take the time and and share with us your beautiful ideas thank you no, i very much enjoyed it really enjoyed it um yep are we good we are okay